Hello and welcome back to the 77%, the show for Africa's youth. This week we are in Koidu. This is Sierra Leone's rich mining district. And in this country, you will find literally anything from coltan to iron ore and diamonds. But it is extracted and very quickly exported. And so today we want to find out, are those exports translating to wealth for the young people who live here? Who better to answer this question for me than fellow Sierra Leoneans? And we're going to begin with Ibrahim. And I just want to get an overview view from you because I've often heard it say that you know had it said that minerals and riches natural riches particularly for Africa can be a curse so guys can you imagine that I just want you guys to think about that for a moment in 2020 alone 313 million dollars was exported from our mineral resources 313 million dollars where is all this money where are these monies and I want to add again, inside 2020 alone, between 2020 and 2021, this government received over $650 million from IMF, World Bank, all of these other places, right? Where are these monies? Where are these monies? I see President Bio come out the other day and talk about, you know, on Twitter page where they talk about now that they pay 1% CDF, Community Development Fund, for the very first time in Tonkolili, which was a very big lie because they've always been paying these monies anyway. Now when I get 1%, it's not on to lawyer to, it's not mandatory for them to do it. The money they already, we not to lie, like government, we will go come with Dango Utuna, they will go eat the money. Now 5 billion leons. It they now in our account already. But this is what is happening. I'm going to let you guys watch the rest of this documentary. It's very powerful. Sierra Leoneans, this, this is brutal, man, what they're doing to our people, what these guys are doing to our country. It's brutal. All of this money is not reflecting on our people. It's pathetic. This is sad. But watch the, watch the documentary. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome back to the 77%, the show for Africa's youth. This week we are in Koidu. This is Sierra Leone's rich mining district. And in this country, you will find literally anything from coltan to iron ore and diamonds. But it is extracted and very quickly exported. And so today we want to find out, are those exports translating to wealth for the young people who live here? Who better to answer this question for me than fellow Sierra Leoneans? And we're going to begin with Ibrahim. And I just want to get an overview view from you because I've often heard it say that you know had it said that minerals and riches natural riches particularly for Africa can be a curse what do you think of this is it a curse well I think very contrary um, minerals cannot be a curse um, endowments are meant for beneficiation are meant for development purpose it's all depend on the type of talent people have in the given sovereignty let me hear from Aya here. He's a student, uh, but he was also mining and in the mines from a very young age at 14. From my own story, when I was 14 years old, I was going to school. I was around a, a junior secondary school in Sierra Leone. I was uh, giving this kind of support to my relatives whom I was staying with back then in order for us to see how we can get our livelihood. It was very difficult. It was very challenging because as a young boy, I had to skip school by then to go to the mines to give support because that was the only source of livelihood we had. And even onto that, I barely escaped that particular period, not uh, falling out of school. Because a lot of colleagues whom we were in that stage with, whom I started schooling with, because of mining activities and because of, you know, the, the effects of mining activities, they were not able to afford the education. Mm -hmm. Today, a good number of them are dropouts. So if we look at the impact of diamond mining to youth, you know, in the wider population in Sierra Leone, for me, it is much of a cause because we are not getting the kind of dividend. We are not getting the kind of profits. Okay, uh, and by the way, we should mention that where we are right now, there's a big mine that operates just beyond this mound. And what we are seeing is a byproduct of that blasting rocks, which are then uh, crushed into smaller pieces by the women we're seeing in the background to then be sold to construction workers. So I'd like to hear from the mayor because we've heard that this region, despite its riches, is not reflective of uh, the diamonds and uh, the gold that's coming out of this region. So I'm wondering why. You're right. Um, the reflection of uh, the natural resources we have, you cannot actually tell whether the diamonds, the golds, and other minerals extracted from Kono whether actually this, uh, this is a place where those minerals are. But on the contrary, to say uh, mineral or diamonds or whatever mineral given to us is a cause. It's not a cause. The availability of the natural resources hasn't, is not a problem. Mm. It is a proper utilization of the mineral resources that has a problem. 
policies around extraction of uh, minerals, these are the problems. If we have a good governance system, uh, system put in place, how to extract, and even if there is a will, political will to bring those um, uh, machines, those technologies, how to transform those raw materials here into a finished product. Actually, um, okay, let's let, me, let, me, let me just bring in Suleiman here because you spoke of policy and he is from the National Mining Agency, the body that is supposed to enforce policy and also create it around the extractive industry. So is it right what the mayor is saying, that we just have a lack of that leadership from national level? Leadership, I can show you now from now, from 2018, that the willingness is there. Now, what the agency is, 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 is focusing of, on mainly is to see the committees where they are, where these where these many are coming from. They benefit from them. So they've ensured that the committees do sign the committee agreement with the communities, so that at the end of every year, their gross annual revenue, some percentage come back to the committee. They have their committees that that deals with these funds to ensure that projects are being. Um, uh, implemented in uh, hold on, AI is already disagreeing with you. Ooh. Yes, um, if we look at what mining companies are getting from Connor District, from the minings that they are doing, and we compare it to the impact in the communities, it is not commensurate. Even the community development agreement that they say they signed with those communities, the amount that is getting back to those communities, it can undertake no tangible development project. Look at the communities. For example, we are very close to one community, which is a located community, which is a, 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 a resettlement. This community lacks water. They are not having access to electricity, and they are very close to this mining company. So what are we talking about in terms of communities benefiting from the mining? What does the Sierra Leonean government say about who mines, where they're allowed to mine, how much comes back into the community? Water, that's a problem everywhere now. But, but this, these settlements, they are doing their best. You have areas that do not have water. But every, day, every now and then these problems come, we, we tell the people, this is the problem of the people, this is the problem of people. So it's ongoing. Yeah. They are trying to address most of these issues. We know the, there are issues. The, the mayor is raising his hand on that side, but I want to hear from Mary for a second, because you grew up in a place that has been mining for a really long time. In fact, some of the earliest diamonds were discovered where you grew up. Did you see this reflected as you were growing up, you know, that, yes, we have good uh, agreements with the... Oh, you're already shaking your head No. Okay, go ahead, tell me. Before this time, um, I think there was a better system in place. Many people benefited from it before even we were born. I think we heard of the, the benefits that our own parents, even our grandparents, we are benefiting. So for the fact that um, um, mining or diamond as a resources, I mean, as a resource, being a cost to us, I personally disagreed with that mm -hmm. first of all because God cannot bless you and in turn curse you again it is we the individuals it is we the leaders our leaders up there what actually are they doing in order to see that the, the their children yet unborn be, are, are benefiting or they will be benefited from these mining companies or from these resources. All That's right. Um, I want to come to uh, Patrick here because he's actually wearing a shirt that says ethical minerals. And what uh, Mary has touched on is really important, that previously there was a system that worked for everyone. But of course the war came and so the term blood diamond and conflict diamond arose. To what uh, extent did the war change and shift the way people think about extractives in this country? Before the war came, I believe the awareness is not there, but now we have the awareness with the youth are coming up. So we, are, we went to school, we, 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 we are encouraged to go to school. So now that we are encouraged to go to school, we want to see that that thing translates. If a company comes to do this necessary needs for the communities, okay. for them to... All right. Um, let me speak to Issa here for a second, because we're hearing that, look, the policies are amazing. It's just the implementation that sucks. And I've heard big companies being named here, but you as a small-scale miner, are you one of the people who is deterring development from happening, perhaps because of bad employment practices? You know, I deal with a lot of people. I had almost 50 miners, people working for me under daily circumstances. <laughs> They've got kids they cannot even feed. They've got kids they cannot even take to the hospitals. They sleep in houses wherein they're cramped and crowded with no mattresses whatsoever. They sleep on the floors. And but surely, Issa, about... isn't that because you're not paying them enough? No, we pay them. When I got here, as an example, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say, we were paying the miners 70 cents per day. 
I thought that wasn't enough. We pay them a dollar. And when the diamond comes out, it's theirs. They tell us how much they want for it, and we negotiate. So we're actually supporting them to make sure they can get on the field and work. I want to come back to Aya for a second, because I want to understand, you know, yeah. uh, I think for people who don't live or come from places where their minds, the imagination is that you come in, you mine for two days, you get a diamond that's about 50 carat, and then your life is set. But what's the reality? Well, the reality, it is on two spheres. For example, if you're doing artisanal mining previously, like a, about two or three decades ago, some people will say by then I was very young and maybe I was not even born two decades, three decades ago. They'll say like they'll leave, their, I was, they'll leave their, their parents or wives at home and say, let me go to the mines and go and take down money and come. But looking at the trend now for the past uh, one decade now, that has changed eventually. On That's, average, how long would an artisanal miner be at the mines before they're able to extract something meaningful? So there are some people, if you ask them from stories, they'll tell you that I've been mining for the past three years and I've not gotten a single diamond. Some people tell you I've been mining for the past three years, the diamonds I've gotten from the mines, it is only worth about $50. Okay, uh, let me hear from Benedict here because he's actually a very busy man. I was joking to him earlier, but he's actually uh, embroiled in eight lawsuits active against big mining companies because of various reasons. So is what we're hearing from a uh, uh, reflective of what you're seeing in your profession, that it's the big mining companies who are raking it big, whereas the communities are basically going with nothing? I cannot specifically add, speak, speak, speak to these uh, matters because they are subject to judicial proceedings, but I'll just reflect on the facts that have been arising out of this debate. Yeah. Communities are calling out and saying we've been oppressed, we've been abused by mining companies, and they are not respecting the laws and policies as articulated by the leadership of this country. But most worrying, it is not the communist behavior that is worrying to the communities, is their leadership attitude towards their oppression and suppression and exploitation. That is what worries them. When we consult with them in chamber, this is what they always raise. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have also is that if that is the persistent matter that we take to court, and in the circumstances, the, the communities are saying, instead our leaders side with us, they are siding with the companies. Let me go to the leader that we have here, the mayor. <laughs> you knew I was coming for you. That's why you're laughing. Uh, so we're hearing that when people come to you and say, hey, these guys are here. They're doing one, two, three to us. You're really not caring about it. You're, you're more concerned about the investment rather than the welfare of the people in your community. True or false? Well, um, when you look at the mining policies in this country, one, uh, it is not done at the local level. Um, our parliament in this country, they formulate those policies at the uh, legislative level. The, 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 the leadership I have, like the local council level of leadership, if you ask me, I think I will stand with the people, the view of the people, because imagine myself as a mayor when we meet at some quarters, other people will say the mayor from a mining rich you know, community and he has a lot of money, the council has a lot of money. But it will surprise you to know that um, since I became a mayor in 2018, we've not received a $10,000 cash from any mining process in this particular community. But give me a second. Let me come to Suleiman. How is that possible, given that the act is very, very clear? 1% of proceeds from mining companies should come back to the communities. Well, the percentages are not static. It depends on the company. And I would like in, in Kornodi Street, we have five large-scale mining companies, but only two are productive now. For every stage, every step you want to take, they have their consultants. They call them, they do environmental social impact assessments to see what, what and this affects the community. They present them to the company. Quarterly, we have the National Minerals Agency board. They come, they do inspection, they see what and what is, is not going right with the company. They give exactly a picture where they are and then where they are going to and then where, where they are from and then where they are going to now. Okay, uh, let me hear from Benedict. Yes, I think um, the point the enemy uh, uh, Suleiman is pointing out yeah. reflects the, our, our, our communities who are uh, fighting against oppression, the attitude of government and political leaders. So the... The, the government agents that are supposed to be protecting. Protecting, supposed to be challenging the companies to deliver to the communities. They are being indicted by our communities that they are colliding and colluding into this oppression. It's a serious issue. It's a security issue. And you look around here. These are the people who own the lands where the diamonds are mined. Mm. They've been reduced 
to the utter level of poverty, minus zero, zero poverty level. Instead of having their children go to school, go to universities, go to hospitals, have good infrastructure. Look at them, the children below 10 years yeah. are smashing stones, dug from the rubbles of the diamond mining of octogenarian type, one of the best quality diamonds in the world. And they cannot see it. It is not accounted for. No one knows what is taking there every day. Let me ask him. Ask him that question. Let me ask Let him. him declare to the people. Okay. So, because earlier you did say that, uh, to be fair, that uh, percentages are not static. But are you able to track and trace how much is being extracted? Okay. Now we are seeing um, enemy has mines compliance officers inside there. Uh -huh. They work on three shift basis. What the mining, uh, the, the company gets, they package everything, they sign, they seal it, they ensure that it is being sealed and then kept in, into a safe. Yeah. Every day on it, on, on three shift basis. So in, in the last year or so, uh, based on what the mayor is saying, you want to tell me that what has been exported, 1% of it does not amount to $10,000? The enemy calculates what they've, they, what they've exported, and then they have the percentage, 0.25%, that comes back to the community, for which the CDCs, they've got their accounts. Those, those money, are not, they are not given, they are not being sent into the primary chief's account. They have the CDC, the committee, com the, the committee, yeah. the committee has their own account. We ensure that before the, the start of the use of the money, they identify projects for which they want to implement. Okay, we what projects have been implemented? I, I mean, I'm sure that is beyond your scope, but I'm just trying the to see, the, if you put money into an account and you never see the results, no, why keep that, putting money I'm, into the account? That's what I'm, 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 I'm telling you now. They've built three secondary schools, uh, two secondary schools and a primary school. And then there are two ongoing projects. One, a health facility as the Yadu community, and the staff quarter is completed. Yeah, I want to come to Issa here for a second because you've recently returned uh, from living abroad. Have you seen any dramatic changes since you've been away? I think, um, um, to be honest, um, Sierra Leone is the only place you come back to, you never get lost because everything remains the same, whether it's in Freetown, it's in Bo. So there has been no changes whatsoever. You know, the question would be, is Diamond the thing that's going to bring that change? For me, I'll say no, because we've seen over um, a century, perhaps, that um, Diamond has made very little impact. We see other countries like the Gambia, Senegal, they've got no diamonds whatsoever. As a matter of fact, they've got peanuts. So for me, I don't know if the answer to Sierra Leone's problem is minerals. And yet you're in the business. I'm in the business because I see there is a bit of an opportunity. I can make changes in people's lives. I help communities. I support people. I spend money on a daily basis. I employ people, direct employment. As a matter of fact, I've got close contact with people in governance. And um, what they say is, we need people like you that are making direct investment, direct employment. So I'm happy to be back home doing whatever little I can do. I see a lot of experts around me. They know what's going on. They know what the problems are. Maybe they need to be engaged a lot more. Maybe there's that sense of responsibility by everyone to make sure we can um, all make an impact. All right. Unfortunately, Issa has to leave because he's a busy man. He's got to sell <laughs> diamonds. But we still have the panel here. Let me say to the last comment uh, uh, the other gentleman said about diamonds is not an answer. Diamonds is an answer. A short while ago before we come here, I googled diamonds in Sierra Leone. I saw blood diamonds, I saw uh, 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 diamonds uh, wrecking lives of people. I did the same, diamonds of Botswana. I saw diamonds lifting, transforming Botswana. I saw the policy mm. in Botswana. Instead of having Octia Mining, a company registered in Virgin Islands, owning 100% of London mining shares in Sierra Leone, and taking over the mines and Octia Diamonds of Sierra Leone, literally presiding over the wealth of Sierra Leone diamonds, Botswana said, no, we have what we call the Swana. That is, the beer and Botswana, the state, owns the mining company that mines and polishes diamonds in Botswana. And guess what? On the records, 80% of the proceeds of the diamonds in Botswana goes to state coffers. And guess what? All of that goes to schools, hospitals, roads, infrastructure. Okay, I, I want to hear from Ibrahim and Aya for a second, uh, because, you know, as everybody is speaking, I'm wondering, you're the people who are living in these communities. Why not take these companies and sue them? Why not protest? Why not demand more from your government? <laughs> Honestly, Kona was 100% destroyed during the civil war. This was the center of the yes, war? Yes, of yeah. the war, probably for the diamonds. But we've also recovered 80% 
because of the diamonds, the small mines, and the other things. And uh, we are progressing, we are competing with other places like McKinney, Bo, the Mayor Cartes. I can't allow you to continue with your thought, knowing full well that this gentleman standing next to you yes. was forced out of school because he was actually a child in the mines. Yes, I'm so also how a victim of what happened here. I was shot so, so in how, one of those how demonstrations. How can it be that diamonds are suddenly now a blessing when we can see that human rights violations are still occurring, children are still being forced into these sites? Yes, that makes me my, my, my work more relevant. In as much as I was nearly killed in one of those demonstrations, the lawyer can attest, I have my testimonies, and it's all over the world, it's in Al Jazeera and other places also. Yeah, you were shot but, uh, during a demonstration. This kind of situation, do we give up hope? Do we say the diamonds should be left? untouched, mm -hmm. we have to mind the diamonds. Let's move to other factors, you know, because there's direct impact and indirect impact. And Mary, I want to hear back from you. The women in these communities, most of them displaced because their land is used for mining, and then they find themselves internally displaced because they can't afford to buy land. They're not allowed to in some cases. Tell me about that. Really, before this time, um, women, we are not allowed to own land. And uh, these land are being regulated by the, the authorities, chiefs and others. So um, for the women, as you can see, they are suffering because they cannot have access to land. And of course, those that, they, those that are being resettled, they were uh, having backyard gardens in their, their previous homes. But now since the resettlement has taken place, those areas that they used to do their backyard garden in order to, to sustain the, themselves with their children are no more you know, in, in existence. They, they, the company never give it to them. And I want to hear from Benedict, how difficult or easy is it to then take some of these uh, companies to court? Because, you know, if I say I used to have two plots and now you've given me a half of what I had, what's the, the procedure? That's why we are in court and we are litigating these matters on a no win no fee basis. Mm. I mean, they do not have the legal fees to pay. They, do not, they cannot afford the cost of lawyers to litigate these matters. And on the contrary, the opposing side, the companies, they have tons of diamonds. They have tons of money unaccounted for. So they can peddle it and hire a battery of lawyers within and outside Syria and contest these matters. And it is not a hidden secret. It is not rocket science to look at the people in Kono and say, hey, mining companies, you have not lived up to your expectations. Mm. So um, I will be challenging the mayors and the district uh, chairman of uh, Kono to come out and challenge their parliament chief and challenge their stakeholders and say, listen, we cannot be put as scapegoats. We are here presiding over a debris. We are here presiding over poverty, yet in the midst of wealth. And another challenge that comes from mining, of course, you're dealing with ethical minerals, I said earlier. Uh, what are some of the implications of, of these uh, extractive practices? if you can even call them that? Well, I would say the implications, like if this big company that are coming into the community, like they, now they use this um, machine, they call extravital, they just mend and they leave the holes like that. Then I believe if they leave it like that for the future generation, they won't have, like now you measure agriculture, they won't have some, some year to do the agriculture because the, the whole, the pit is left open. Okay, Suleiman, I like the fact that you're raising your hand because I wanted to ask, what does the NMA say about this? So we tell them after mining, you reclaim the land because after mining, there's, there are other use of land. So what you're saying is the companies are compelled or they're supposed to? Yeah, supposed, yeah, to. supposed to. All right, so yeah, my experience is that uh, the NMA and the EPA are literally doing nothing in terms of preservation and protection of the environment. Because if you look at the pits uh, that are I all around... But I do know that the protection agency, to be fair, they've been trying to plant trees. They're doing their best to recover and reclaim some of them. We are the trees that they are planting. The trees are not growing. Mm. The trees that they are planting are not even looking after the trees. For me, most of the institu institutions that are uh, manning the affairs of the environment, they are just paying lip service to the people. If you go to Nime Koro Chief Dome, we are one of the biggest uh, gold mines located in Kono District. They are polluted the water sources that is there. The communities are suffering at this point in time. The stream that is there has been polluted as a result of the mining operation. Fishes and other uh, 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 living things that are living in those streams along, you know, uh, the places where these mining operations are being carried out, specifically in Nime Koro Chief Dome, all these things are being destroyed. Yeah. So what are they doing in terms of preservation of the environment? So we've had quite a myriad of challenges related to both large-scale and small-scale mining, particularly in this region. And now I want to find out from my panelists, how do we move forward? You know, as the sun sets down, I want to hear what we can do to change the situation because it's persisted for decades. Mary, you have something to say to me? All these issues that we have deliberated on 
we have a way forward. How could we? The, the top management has to change their attitude, especially in the area of these mining companies. We are saying the system, um, um, the policies that are already in place should be implemented. We should stop saying them. Let's implement it. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, regarding women, we have several structures in place. Even these uh, uh, um, um, uh, stone crushers, women, we have them as an association. So these structures, um, if we want to um, empower them. There are several other ways. Maybe in agriculture, we can bring up agricultural pro I mean programs, yeah. and we subscribe them to to that agricultural programs. So mm. empowering women, creating skills for them, skills and also for them, diversifying of sources course. of income. Of All course. right, Ibrahim, any solutions for me? Yes, that 10, 20 percent of all proceeds coming from the mine should go to the women and the children okay. for education, for brilliant students, and mm -hmm. their community support. Does anybody else have a solution that we haven't heard yet? I think the government, central government, must realize and must understand that it is the future of these children that has been put in jeopardy for the, from the mines. And the government has a singular responsibility. If they want to do it, they can do it next tomorrow. Or they can even do it today. The excuses, the, 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 the structural adjustments, the reliance on foreign donors and even IMF does not ne is not necessary if they can really utilize the resources that are coming here. And like I said to the enemy uh, gentleman, we don't know what comes there every day. Mm. Even if they say they know, they are not publishing it. So how can we claim the 1% or the 3% that is agreed in the first place? How would you calculate 100% all over what? Right. Nothing. So the government must be transparent, accountable, and development must not be a party pol political issue. Once you are in government, you are government for everybody. Okay, well, at the beginning of this debate, I asked if the riches that are found largely underground in this country present a curse or not to the economy and the people of this region. What I've heard in a resounding way is that no, they're not. It's simply how they're handled or mishandled. I don't know what your viewpoint is, but thank you for watching.